All right. Yeah, good morning, everybody. We sure want to welcome you to our Polar Connect event. Uh, today's event uh, will be with uh, our Polar Trek teacher, Svea Anderson, and the research team that's working with uh, Dr. Uh, Sidonia, or Doni, as we call her, Bret Hart. And there she is. Good morning, Doni. Um, today is Monday, August 13th, 2018. Um, we're going to be learning a lot of science around um, uh, plants in the Arctic, and uh, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Bret Hart and Sia in just a little bit. Before we get started, a couple things. Um, today's video is just one way. We can't see all of your wonderful faces out there, but hopefully you can see um, the research team up in the upper left-hand corner. The slides uh, that they want to share with us will be in the center of the screen. You can see there's a list of participants. And if you have any questions or want to say hello and tell us where you're from, we ask you use the public chat, and that way everybody can see it. So while I'm uh, going along here, feel free to type in who's with you and where you're all joining in, um, from. Uh, this event is being archived, and we'll um, put out the link on the website and send it out to everybody that registered as well and share it with um, Svia so she can share it with you. Um, a few things about Polar Trek. Polar Trek is a, uh, um, a project where we place uh, teachers with researchers like Dr. Bret Hart. Um, and they go to the polar regions, either the Arctic or the Antarctic. We're funded by the National Science Foundation. And the program is run by a nonprofit in, um, primarily based in Fairbanks, Alaska, called the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. If you're a teacher out there that's interested in this kind of professional development, um, in September we're going to be opening up our application process to new teachers for 2019 and 20 pending funding. So please keep posted on that, um, this opportunity. And I'm sure Svea and Dr. Bret Hart will be happy to share uh, their experience with you. Um, questions today. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll inter interject and interrupt the team as we go along and have them answered. And then hopefully at the end, you can also ask your questions live. So I think that's it. Um, if anybody has trouble hearing because um, of where uh, the team is at, let us know in the chat box and we'll ask them to speak up or shift around or something if you're having trouble with any of the technology. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Svea and Dr. Brethart. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, Wyatt, we're actually one hour different. Um, so we don't participate in the uh, time zone changes. So usually, if so right now we're just one hour different. So right now it's uh, 9.30 our time, um, not two hours earlier. But um, Janet was absolutely correct. This is an incredible experience. Applications are open. It's, it's an easy process. But um, just I am so incredibly grateful to have been selected. Uh, this has just been a whirlwind of experience. So uh, Dr. Bret Hart has um, you're amazing, Yay. and also has become my friend, so it's really nice. Um, and so I'm going to just introduce myself, because I didn't make a slide for me, and then I will introduce you. Uh, so I'm Svea Anderson. I teach sixth grade in Tucson, Arizona, um, also the district STEM coordinator. Uh, and I have been in Alaska since July 6th, which is pretty crazy. I've missed the entire like Tucson summer, which I think it might have been. <laughs> Could be a good thing. Could be a good thing. It's hot there, right? I'm cold today. It's cold. Um, and uh, and this, I've always kind of been interested in uh, science and action and in the field. Um, and this has just been an awesome opportunity to be part of the whole process of going out. And we'll talk a little bit about Dr. Bret Hart's um, project, but like really being able to experience it firsthand and, and knowing now really to reiterate what, what I can do back in my classroom. So I have lots of ideas. I'm bringing home some mosses, so we're going to look for tardigrades uh, when I come back from Lake Water Bears. Hopefully we find some. But um, yeah, it's just been an awesome experience. And this is my amazing researcher, Dr. Brett Hart. And so she's awesome. And so I'll let her introduce herself as well. We have to talk um, about just a quick 
just a quick interruption, ladies. You're going to have to use your, your loud voices and um, talk directly into the computer because uh, a couple of people are having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Oh, Thank sorry. you. Okay, so stay if it's not loud enough. Um, so my name is Joni Bretthart. I'm a faculty member at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I've worked up at the Tulick Field Station in northern Alaska uh, for about 20 five years now, which is kind of amazing. Um, so I've been working in the Arctic for a long time. But I actually grew up in Tucson, so shout out to all you folks in Tucson. I lived there till I was 11. Um, and actually, yeah, no, I, was, I guess I was uh, 14, 13, actually. And then I moved to Oregon. And then after that, I went to school in Oregon and in California. Um, and then I did a, some postdocs. Um, in California and on the East Coast, and I got really interested in the Arctic actually as a postdoc, so I didn't start as a graduate student in Arctic studies, but I moved into it after that. And I've been at the University of Alaska Fairbanks since 1998. Um, and I'm really interested in plants. I started off as a plant physiologist, so that's trying to understand how plants function and why they function the way they do, and how that function is changed by interacting with the environment. And then I kind of graduated from that to thinking about how plants affect the environment around them and the, the whole ecosystem. And now I would call myself an ecosystem and plant ecologist with an interest in how plant species affect the cycling of carbon and nitrogen in the soil. Carbon and nitrogen are linked because nitrogen is what limits plant growth. And carbon, the storage of carbon, is, uh, is very important um, for for actually for the entire world because there's a lot of carbon that's stored in the Arctic and the boil parts of the world or the northern parts. And so I'm very interested in how plants affect that storage of carbon. If that carbon was to be released to the atmosphere, it would greatly speed up the process of warming the planet. So it's a very topical subject and one that I've been able to be happy to work on for a number of years. That's a great introduction. Do you want to go ahead to the next slide and we'll show the Tussock snow fence? Okay, and I'm going to, uh, some people are still having a hard time hearing you, so I think when you two talk, you might have to lean in a little bit and okay. towards your microphone on your computer. Okay. Oh, what are the penguins <laughs> in the previous photo? There are no penguins in the Arctic. There are no penguins in the Arctic, except to blow two up one. inflatable penguins, <laughs> yes. So our friend Eugene, who helped us with this plant harvest, brought them up because he had worked in Antarctica, Antarctica before. And actually that picture, the, they're serving as emotional support penguins because I sprained my ankle. So they're keeping me company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but really, there are no penguins in Antarctica. <laughs> that was like my mantra before I left. There is no penguins. There's polar bears. We haven't seen any, though. No, no, no polar bears. No polar bears. Only on the coast. Only on the coast. So um, this is one of Dr. Bret Hart's plots. Uh, this is the Tussock snow fence plot. And you can see the snow fence is put up. And in the background, that's Tulick Field Station. That's where we're located. Um, you want to talk a little bit about, uh, talk about when you put it up? And sure. So I, that snow fence is, so the wind comes from the south in the winter, and it and that means when it encounters the fence, what happens is the air is moving along and it counters the fence and that slows it down. And so it kind of stalls out behind the fence and it drops snow on the other side of the fence from the side that you see here. So the snow builds up on the north side. And so we were really interested in understanding um, what would be the effects of more snow for two reasons. The first is that we think that there will be more snow as the Arctic warms, because right now the air is super cold and dry in the winter, so it can't hold very much moisture. But as the climate warms, especially in the winter, probably that water holding capacity will go up, and so we'll get more snow falling. And secondly, we were interested in this because there was this hypothesis that shrubs trap snow, and that snow insulates the soil over the winter. It keeps the soil from getting so cold. And um, once, and so, if the soil is warmer, then decomposition can happen over the winter, and that will release nitrogen from the dead organic material that makes up most of the soil. And so that will then potentially allow the plants to have more nitrogen, and it might change the partitioning of nitrogen between different plant species. So we were checking all that out with the snow fence. It's been up for 12 years. And in, in 2006, we actually 
uh, injected a very low level of um, stable isotope nitrogen, uh, 15N nitrogen. So it's not radioactive, it's stable. But it acts as a tracer because most of the nitrogen in the world is, is 14N. And that will allow us to see the, how the partitioning has changed. And we can look at how, where that label ends up in the plants. And so we harvested some plots long ago in 2007 after one year. And we didn't see any effect of snow, although there were big differences between snow fences that had different amounts of shrubs. But after 12 years, we think we might see some pretty, pretty strong differences. So that was what we were doing. Kia was helping with that um, harvest of the plants and soils. And that will tell us a bit about how we expect nitrogen cycling to change and also carbon storage in the soil to change if we get more snow. Awesome. So the next slide is a second site that Dr. Bret Hart has up here at Tulip. And this is called the Riparian Snow Fence Plot. And uh, you can kind of see that there's a little stream running through the middle of the picture. Exactly, right? And so this one is a little bit different than the tussock. So a tussock tundra is tussocks are um, kind of little, for simple terms, like little mounds that have the plants have been growing and pushing the earth up. Uh, and this one is uh, almost, I don't know, would you say marshy? Foggy. A little more marshy, yeah. Yeah, there's riparian, riparian. next to the stream. Uh, and so this one is across the street. Uh, sorry, not street. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the northeast side of the lake. The northeast side of the, <laughs> the lake. The other one's on the south side of the lake. Right. So. And so both of these sites were chosen because of the plants that were there in 2006. So this is the second site. And Dr. Bret Hart and I went out and collected foliage samples from this site. And uh, it could potentially be harvested uh, sometime soon. Yeah, so we might harvest this next year. We Originally, we were planning to harvest them both at the same time because we also labeled at this site. But there's been an interesting complication that we weren't expecting. So we chose this site. This riparian site mainly because it had shrubs that were taller and more dense than at the, the tussock site. And so we thought that it would be a nice comparison of sort of differences in shrub height and abundance. Um, and there's an, a third site that has even taller shrubs. We didn't label there because we thought maybe th those shrubs were as big as they could get, whereas here we thought snow might actually help these shrubs get larger, potentially. Um, and so we labeled here as well, but then we discovered that there's this disease that's affecting one of the types of shrubs, one of the dominant types of shrubs. And it's, the disease has evidently been really helped by the snow as well. And so on the, the um, drift side of the fence where the snow accumulates, there's almost none of this type of shrub left. So that is a is very interesting observation, but it sort of confounds the experiment a little bit because we don't know whether that was caused by the disease or caused by the snow or the combination of the disease and the snow. And so we wanted to uh, see whether we could recover enough label from these label plots in the foliage to make it worthwhile to do a harvest and think about also it would be helpful if we could identify the disease, which we haven't been able to do yet, although it's very widespread. Awesome. And so somebody asked, what are the blue flags uh, in the picture? And uh, those are just quadrat markers. Yeah, I think that those are flags that are marking the position of probably resin bags or um, cores that are are put in to incubate to see what happens to the soil when it's in this location. Yeah, awesome. You want to go to the next slide and we'll show you some photos from the field. This is Dr. Brett Hart modeling what we wear in the field. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the conversations earlier was about the mosquitoes. Um, we call them the ladies of the tundra. Uh, they are photobombing in the middle, right? You can see them. They are not the size of helicopters, but pretty close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're very numerous, even though they're small. <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. Uh, and that's Dr. Brad Hart in the left picture, and she's out taking notes. Uh, one of the things that has been reiterated to me throughout is the importance of taking notes and taking daily notes throughout the field experience. Uh, and so there she is taking notes wearing her bug suit. And then uh, in the other photo on the right-hand side, Dr. Brett Hart has a uh, sample that's a quadrat plot that she has pulled out. Uh, and so we did a lot of those. There were 48 qu uh, quadrats that we pulled out this year. Plots. So in those quadrats, we're looking at the plant biomass by different species and, and um, also different tissue types, so like leaves versus stems versus roots. And then we're also looking at the soil to see how much of that label we originally injected we can recover mm -hmm. um, and how it's distributed. And then we'll compare that with how it was in the past when we first 
out of the loop. So mm -hmm. it should be really interesting to see um, whether the snow has, has changed that. And I think that it seems clear that the biomass, just from looking at it, is likely going to be quite different on the two sides of the fence now. And it also looks as if the, the ground is wetter on the snow fence the snow side, the drift side, mm -hmm. and perhaps the thaw depth is deeper there as well. So that yeah. might, we're still analyzing the data, but it'll be exciting to see. That might be today's job is going out and measuring thaw depth. And so then you put a probe into the ground and you hit the permafrost. And so it's that difference. Uh, we just did that on Saturday at a different field site. And I'm bringing that data home to my sixth graders so that they can plot that parcel. So, uh, and I see the question from the second graders. We I, you might have seen them before, but I just saw my first snow owl on Saturday. It was flying by the truck as we were traveling. Uh, but we have, what is, what is it, short-eared owls? Short-eared owls up yeah, here. Yeah, yeah short-eared so owls. Snowy yeah. owls are more coast, coastal owls. And so at, we did see some actually down by our other site, which is north of Tulip, about 90 miles. But um, but up here, mostly we see short-eared owls, which are a little bit smaller and more gray. But they're a beautiful owl Oh, my gosh. Well. And they fly. They're just incredible. Do you want to go ahead to the next slide and say where we are. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> just real quick though, um, before you go to where you are, there was a question earlier when you said that, <clears throat> sorry, my voices went away, when you said that the plants were dying on one side of the fence, they wanted to know what kind of disease, was it a fungus? We don't know what kind of disease it is. That's one of the mysteries. Um, it, I think it's something internal that plugs up their vascular system and it might be a fungus or it might be a bacteria, but we don't have a positive identification yet. So that's how come science is like about solving mysteries. Uh, we're going to try okay. to to look into oh, it. Go ahead. Oh, and then the actual plots, the size of the actual plots, they were, how big were the yeah. quadrats? Uh, 10 by 40 centimeters. Um, and okay, and then yeah. how long is the snow fence? That was the snow other one. Is, um, 60 meters long, 62 meters long, actually. So there are so there we have replicate plots behind the fences so that or there's only one fence of that size so we they're kind of randomly distributed along both sides of the fence the control side and the um, drift side and then the labeled plots were originally set up around individual shrubs because it was focused on shrubs of either salix which is a willow or betula which is birch um, and then we harvested a 40 by 40 centimeter area around each of those types of shrubs. And we harvested three sets of four each on each side of the fence. And this is the last replicate. So there's um, eight uh, labeled plots that were left that had never been disturbed. And those are the ones that we harvested. We took two quadrats out of each one of those. And then we took an additional eight quadrats just randomly distributed to get a better idea of sort of variability in biomass, but not necessarily labels. So it was a sort of complicated design, and that was on each side of the fence. So and that's we, how we got up to 48 total. Yeah, we have pictures coming up in the next few slides. You'll see exactly what it looks like. So Tulik is uh, Tulik is pretty far north. We're on the north slope of the Brooks Range, uh, and you get there through the Dalton Highway. Uh, and so, um, yeah. <laughs> There's really, it's about uh, nine hours from Fairbanks on a gravel, mostly gravel road with some paved sections in the northern foothills of the Brooks Range, which is a beautiful mountain range that you would see Gorgeous, behind us, except that it's really cloudy fog, today. Yeah, fog, mm -hmm. fog. Um, and this area that we're in, the, the tussock tundra, is a really widespread vegetation type in Alaska. It covers, I think, about 538,000 acres of the foothill terrain, so that's why Understanding what happens in it will give us some ability to extrapolate to a larger part of the north slope. Um, and that's why that fence is, that particular fence is located where it is, where there's sort of low shrubs that are not super abundant as compared to that right here in this area. And so then there was a question about what type of plant life we're taking out. And it's all mm -hmm. the plants that are in that yes. area, including mosses and vascular plants, uh, shrubs, graminoids, uh, which are like grass-like plants. Um, dwarf, uh, dwarf, deciduous and dwarf evergreen shrubs and mosses and lichens. So yeah, whole, all the mix of plants that occur in the tundra. Right. There's pictures coming up too. So do you want to go ahead to the next one? Next slide. So this is the field station um, in the upper left-hand corner. That's lab two. That's where we're housed out of uh, the bike in front. 
uh, it's to the left. And then to the upper right hand picture, uh, those are the housing. Uh, and so those are, I can't, I can't see Weatherport 10. Weatherport 10, that's where we stay. Uh, down below in the left hand corner, that's Tulick Lake, which is an absolutely beautiful lake, glacier made. And then over to the right is the building that we're, we're connecting with you from. That's the dining hall. So it has walls and pictures. <laughs> and one, lots of wonderful food. <laughs> and lots of really good food. Uh, yeah, and never ending supply of coffee. So it's really a good place to stay. Do you um, want to go ahead to the next? Did you want to add anything about that? So the weather the first week was kind of warm. I uh, got here and it was over 60, which, um, it, which was uh, is that unusual for up here? It's not. Uh, it, what was unusual about it was that it was happening so late. So Steve got here almost at the end of July. And usually July is our warmest month, but it's usually warmer earlier. But it was quite toasty when she got here. Toasty by Arctic standards is not the same as Tucson standards, but it was over 60. And it was very green, and there were lots and lots of mosquitoes. And then um, this week and last week, it's it's dropped. The weather has dropped um, considerably, and uh, it's uh, 30s today. So sorry if I'm breaking up. I was told to speak louder, so I will try to do that. Do you want to go ahead and advance to the next slide? So this is kind of the question from Miss Moe's class, like what kind of plant? That's Dr. Brett Hart and myself in the field. Uh, this is the picture to the uh, on the left-hand side, that is an assortment of the plants that we were finding in the tundra. Um, and then the other, the upper right-hand side is also uh, another deciduous shrub. That's a salix. So on the left side, you see uh, some examples, like up at the top is the dwarf birch, which has the sort of green yep, and yellow exactly. background leaves. It's just like a birch tree, but it's sort of small and, and horizontal. And then below that, with the red and green, is the Vaccinium udoliginosum, which is a blueberry, northern blueberry. But this red color you see is sort of an interesting uh, phenomenon that occurs around here fairly commonly, although not every plant. So that's actually caused by a fungus that is causing the plant leaves to puff up and turn red and look like a flower in hopes of attracting pollinators. And then the pollinators, when they come, they're fooled by that, and they actually disperse the fungal spores instead. So the fungus has very cleverly um, is, has developed a mimicry of the whole floral pollination system and is using it to its own advantage. Um, so that's a an, just an example of sort of a fun, like weird little thing that can happen in the tundra. There's several of those fungi that do that. There's one that affects the little cranberry, the, which is vaccinated by its idea. It's in the same family, so maybe it's equally susceptible to this. Um, and yeah, and so and then down below that you can kind of see some mosses and lichens and some plant litter and there's some gra graminoids, those grass-like things that are a little bit to the left of the yep, yeah, exactly right there. Right there. Yep. So there's so all the plants. There's like a whole diversity of plants, but they're just all really small, and that yeah. that makes you feel like you can understand what they're going to do. And then of course you find out they're more complicated than you thought. And then, yeah, but um, that's my favorite plant, by the way, the bog blueberry. It's so adorable. The leaves are so cute. <laughs> and the I, berries are so tasty. Oh, so good. And I know that's Janet's favorite plant, too. Do you want to go ahead and, and go to the next? Oh, and there was a question about whether they still produce flowers. No, unfortunately, that fungus kills off that part of the plant. So the rest of the plant will survive. But the part that turns red is toast after today. <laughs> so our fauna are mosquitoes. That is what we've seen in mass. Uh, that is my head covered in mosquitoes, which is why we wear bug suits. Um, but uh, thanks, Miss Mo, for joining us. Have a great day. I know. So if Miss Thompson's class is leaving, uh, shout out to my girl, Lila. Hi. Hi, Lila. So, anyways, thanks for joining <laughs> us. Um, so yeah, so we've seen lots of mosquitoes. Um, oh, Lila says hi. Do you uh, want to go ahead to the next screen? We'll just kind of. We saw other fauna too, but but uh, <laughs> the mosquitoes were definitely the most common. Most common. <laughs> so Dr. Bret Hart kind of has already gone over what we're doing. She injected the Tussex snow pens with 15N in 2006. 
2018 this summer, we harvested the 48 plots, the quadrats. And then um, the pluck includes uh, looking at the quadrats and then separating the plants by species and then by individual parts. And so I think we'll go to the next couple of slides so that you can see pictures of what we're talking about. So if you want to go to the next one, unless you wanted to add another slide. So this is the harvesting of the quadrats. Nope. Okay. Yep, perfect. So uh, this is me in the field. In the upper left-hand corner, I'm holding a, um, a large knife. Large knife. <laughs> Dangerous Ms. Anderson. <laughs> yeah, I was living on the edge. Uh, and so we go out and we have these flags that mark the edges of the quadrats. Uh, the next picture is to the right of that is me actually cutting, which the bottom got cut up, unfortunately. But you take the knife and you actually just slice into the earth. Um, the lower left-hand corner are the two quadrats that have been removed. So we're just taking two small slices of the quadrat. The middle part is actually left for uh, a uh, researcher who's from NAU, uh, who is part of this grant project. Um, and her team was looking at the soils and roots. So we intentionally left that middle piece for her team. And then on the lower right-hand corner, um, even though it looks like I have elephantitis in my arm, I do not. It's the wind whipping. Uh, we, carry the, um, we carry the earth back in bags. Uh, very carefully labeled. Uh, we do not separate anything. We change out our gloves in between each plot um, to make sure that nothing gets contaminated. And then we have this long walk on the boardwalk back to Kulik uh, Field Station. It's not really that long, but it seems long when you're carrying heavy bags. Yeah, and earth. when you're wearing like 20 pounds of gear. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you want to go uh, to the next slide, thanks, Ms. Thompson, for joining us. So this is inside the lab. This is our pluck this year. And so you can see in the left-hand picture, there's a bag, and that's full of earth. And we earth and plants. Earth and plants. Uh, and we take, the, we take them out, and that's in the upper right-hand corner. That's the initial beginning of it. And very, very carefully, uh, with tweezers, we go through every piece of it to separate out roots and plants. Uh, we separate them by species, we uh, separate the roots. I'm not, I was so, never very good at this. Not and the roots, the rhizomes. rhizomes. The underground stems, so the, the top of the plant, which is the leaves and um, the new things that grew, and then also the below ground stems. And then we get the roots actually from a separate um, set of cores that we take because there's just so much earth in that 10 by 40 centimeter that getting all the roots would be impossible. So we're sort of subsampling the roots. We get the roots by depth in their top Upper five centimeters of the soil in an organic layer, and then below that in the mineral layer separately, so we can see how root density changes with depth and how much carbon is in the roots, carbon and nitrogen is in the roots and in the rest of the soil, and then in each of the different plant cells. So in the lower right hand corner, you'll see that that is divided up into the different parts of that plant. And so there's the blade, there's a sheath, there's the rhizome. So every part is saved labeled and um, weighed, dried, in, weighed, an oven and dried weighed. in an oven, and then we weigh it. We've been weighing this week as well. And then they'll go back down to uh, University of Fairbanks, where they're put in a mass spectrom spectrometer, uh, where the rest well, of the research. Yeah. yeah, first they'll get ground up into a fine powder, and then they'll get rolled into little tin capsules, and then the tin capsules will get combusted in the mass spectrometer, and the ratio of the 15N to the 14N 13 C to the 12 C will get combined. And that gives us percentage of CNN and also the amount of label. So the work that we did this summer is not done by any no, stretch no, of the it's imagination. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. <laughs> so Dr. Bret Hart has a long year ahead. Yes, I do. So, and then I think the last slide is our last slide. Um, there's two more. Okay, okay, yeah. So there were 14 volunteers with us this year. And there's Dr. Bret Hart and I smiling. Because uh, I think we were almost we're having done. so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> we did long days. Uh, they we started the pluck around uh, nine and ended at dinner time, which was six, um, if not after dinner till a couple nights. We worked till ten. Um, but you can't uh, leave the plants out once they've been opened because they'll dry out and it's hard to start back up. Um, let's yeah. See. So we yeah. Have so here, so I, I was going to say related. Related to your questions earlier, how much does uh, 
it take for you to sort the uh, pluck one of your bags? Like how long does that take? And then uh, what is the highest number of plants that you found in one bag? Um, so we, it takes, it sort of depends on the people that are involved, but we were using lots of volunteers and, and you know, it takes a little while to get up to speed on how to do it. So we would do like about eight of those per day uh, with 14 people. So, you know, we would work in teams together so that you're not so overwhelmed by having a, a giant one by yourself. And that would take, uh, so it was like one in, like less than, less than one per person per day. <laughs> like yeah. three quarters of one per person per day. Um, and then the highest number of different plants. Well, um, you know, we are not separating, like the, the mosses are very diverse, but it's actually kind of tricky and the lichens too to separate them all into species. So we didn't, we just took green moss and lichens as single categories and I would say that we would usually have kind of like 10 to 12 different types of things in one mm -hmm. quadrat. So can anyone volunteer to help you with the plus? Dr. Anyone can volunteer, but I will we'll interview them and make sure <laughs> that they, I feel like they can have good enough attention to detail to do this. And uh, Yeah, you need a lot of attention to detail. You do need attention to detail. So yeah. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Contact me if you're interested. We don't do this every year, but I think we'll be doing one next year. So a possibility. Mm -hmm. I may be back. <laughs> that's right. That's right. She's good at this now. <laughs> I can identify my plants. So uh, I think we have one more slide, or is that the end? Um, that was the end. Um, so I think at this time, if people have questions, we can uh, go to those. So let's see if anybody wants to ask questions so if you if you want to ask your question live you're welcome to do so we just gotta um, make sure that your mic is open or type your questions in there so while we're waiting for questions uh donnie and sphia uh, why don't you tell us what's next what's happening next with you so we are um wrapping up things before the winter. Um, so we're measuring thaw depth and we're gonna put out little temperature loggers um, to measure the temperature over the winter, um, actually at our new snow fence site. So we're setting up some new snow fences in a, a different location that has very large alders. Alders are a species that has a lot of potential to actually change nitrogen cycling on the North Slope because they fix nitrogen in, co in combination with their microbial partners. And they don't occur at Tulip because it's too cold and high elevation for them here, but there's some that are farther north. So we're setting up, we set up some snow fences there and we're going to be measuring temperature and we're going to collect information on thaw depth and we've got to finish weighing all the stuff and then we're going to be heading out for back to Fairbanks because the academic term's already starting. Right, right. <laughs> so I see Zane wants to know what other wildlife we've seen um, here at Tulip. Uh, or, well, I'll just talk about in general. Um, yeah. So we've seen, uh, Dr. Brad Hart and I have seen lots of evidence of bear. Uh, yesterday there was a bear here at Tulip. Uh, neither of us saw it though, which is pretty good because it was on the hike that Dr. Brad Hart was on. And, uh, yeah, so there was I'm a happy big, to see them from a distance. <laughs> yeah, so there was a grizzly bear. Uh, I saw, uh, we've seen muskox. Yesterday I saw the largest herd I've ever seen. It was 25 to 30 muskox. Uh, lots of caribou. We've had caribou in camp. We have a couple um, camp foxes. They're adorable. They eat uh, the ground squirrels. Uh, we call them tundra burritos because they're <laughs> a meal on the go. Uh, <laughs> um, what else have we seen? Uh, I've seen a lot of animals since I've been in Alaska. I've seen whales and puffins and seals and otters and moose, lots of moose. Um, but here in Tulik, uh, yeah, mosquitoes. Yeah, a lot of mosquitoes. Well, and the, there's lots of there's lots of ground squirrels around lots camp too, squirrels. and 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 some voles, so little animals, um, small mammals, and lots of birds too. Uh, the owls, but of course lots of other birds. There's the loons, which live on oh, the yeah. lake. Mm -hmm. Beautiful large loons, and and actually just yesterday there was an exciting encounter where our loon, the yellow-billed loon, which is the biggest loon, was attacking a red-throated loon that had had the misfortune to land and think this might be a nice lake for it. And our loon was having none of that. Oh, so no. It drove that loon away. They're very territorial. <laughs> They're very territorial. So, yeah. So, uh, Arctic foxes are here. Uh, the camp foxes that we have are red, red foxes. foxes. 
Yeah, yeah. Arctic foxes are closer to the coast. Yeah. Um, and Marina wants to know if I would do it again. Absolutely. It was amazing. So hopefully I, this is not my only time I do it. Yeah, and so, so someone asked whether rising temperatures will affect the sequestration of carbon, and the answer is yes. That's a big, a big issue because the northern parts of the world right now, the boreal forest, the, the places with, with permafrost soils, have about three times the carbon that's in the atmosphere. So if all that was to go into the atmosphere, then the CO2 concentration would rise from 410, which it is right now, to like 1,200, which is just a crazy hot amount. It probably won't all go into the atmosphere, but we would like to keep as much of it in the ground as possible. And so we're interested in understanding what controls, what keeps that carbon there. And yeah, and, it, and obviously um, it would be probably the best for the world in terms of adaptation if that change would happen more slowly rather than really fast. Right. Uh, Ms. Ingerson's class wants to know about daylight. Um, <laughs> very different. It's very different. Um, it has, I haven't, I kind of miss dark though. It doesn't get dark here. It, it's eerie. So um, you can go out at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and it's still very light out. Uh, there is sunset at about 1130, but the sun never completely goes past the horizon. Uh, so there's always a kind of a, it's kind of like a twilight. Right. Yeah, so it's, well, and we're heading into darkness, yeah. so just this, so the poles of the world <laughs> have 24 hours of light in the summer and then 24 hours of darkness in the winter. So right. on the equinox, which is September 2nd or something, it'll be the same amount of light here as everywhere else in the world, including Tucson. But then it will plunge rapidly into very dark here, where Tucson will stay much more light. And in Fairbanks, where we are south of the Arctic Circle, it doesn't get completely dark, but we only have about maybe three and a half hours of daylight on the darkest day of the year, um, you know, in December. And um, in Tulik, at Tulik, it'll be like just twilight at that time. You won't, it won't be any actual daylight because it's north of the Arctic Circle. But then in the summer, you know, it's in the, on June 21st, when the, at the summer equinox, the sun doesn't even go down here. It just goes around in a big circle. And so, uh, oh, is that Tricky T? Tricky T wants to know what time work starts. It starts at 9. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because yeah. breakfast is from 7.30 to 8.30. And you got to go to breakfast. And you got to go to breakfast. You got to go to breakfast. <laughs> you have to get your coffee. Um, yeah, there was a question from Lauren. Uh, Spia wanted, or Lauren wants to know, what was the most interesting thing you've learned or experienced while in Tulip so far? Interesting. I know. I asked, I've gotten asked that question, and I don't know how to answer it. Um, I, it just, uh, it's just been such an awesome opportunity. Uh, I, the plants, I'm enamored with the plants. They're little survivors. Uh, I, I love being part of the research. I've made new friends. Uh, it just, it's been, I just am in awe of the entire thing. So I don't have a favorite. It's just, it's all just <laughs> like somebody said, you look so happy in, in one of my pictures. And I was like, how could you not be happy here? <laughs> like, what an awesome opportunity. Um, I'm in the Brooks Range. We're hiking. We're working in the field. I'm seeing things I've never seen before. Um, so, you know, but it, it's, it's an awesome experience. Spay is a good example of a person who's interested in everything, so it's hard to say what's the most interesting thing. I know, thing. right? Exactly. And I that's like a great all. way to be if you're a scientist. You know, you want to be open to all things that you can learn from nature. Right. Uh, Daniel, the tents do not have have insulation. Um, they're thicker than like a regular tent, but it's I'm cold. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they have an insulated blanket, but it there's no source of heat other than the little space heaters and the insulation isn't good enough. It's not like a wall. So yeah, they're a, a little on the cool side for sure. And by cool, she means cold. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you want a nice thick sleeping bag. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a minus 15 bag and it makes me happy. So Thank you, Mr. Screema, for coming. And uh, yeah. Um, let me see. There was a there was a question earlier. Um, let's see. Nathan would like to know in which setting you saw the most wildlife. Most wildlife. 
You mean um, different numbers of different types of wildlife or the most individuals of the wildlife? Ooh, that's a good question. Clarifying. Clarify that, Nathan. He's, he's one of them. So maybe he'll explain. Okay. okay. And then I, you already kind of responded to Ava's question about would you like to know what's the most interesting thing? So yeah. let me see. Okay, so he, he wants the most individuals. So I guess I would say that perhaps the most individuals were here because there's so many mosquitoes. <laughs> there were more mosquitoes here than it seems like. You know, when we were at Saguan, it was cooler and there weren't so abundant. But mosquitoes. there were still mosquitoes. There were still mosquitoes. So yeah. They weren't bothering us as much. And they, they're not. When we first got here, there was a mass amount, uh, but it's getting cooler, and so their their numbers are dwindling. Numbers but are still here. <laughs> still um, here. I don't know if you re I don't know if you responded to this one yet or not, Sphia. I missed. I might have missed your reply, but um, somebody wanted to know: Would you do this opportunity again if uh, you were asked? In a heartbeat. Okay. Yeah, I would. Okay. And, and somebody. Ryan wants oh, to know. Oh, and then a fifth. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was looking at the Creston screen, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um. A. Um. And I don't know if you answered this one either. Um. A fifth grader wanted to know how long you've been there. Uh, I've been at Tulick since July twenty fourth, so just about a little over three weeks. So, and I see Ryan wants to know what the dangers. Uh, we carry we carry bear spray uh, when we go into the field. Always, uh, you're not allowed to hike by yourself. You always have to have somebody with you. Um, we have a checkout system here at Tulix, so you have to sign out on a board. You have to say where you're going, what time you're expected back, what your overdue time is, and then if you pass your overdue time, they uh, will try to find you. So some of the other hazards that you can encounter um, are. First of all, if the weather changes suddenly you, and you're not prepared for that, so everybody needs to take their warm gear and rain gear and stuff with them, mm -hmm. even if it looks really nice when you leave the station, because the weather here can just change in a heartbeat. It's really, really quickly. Um, also, the another hazard is um, is uh, if you are well, the ground is very rough, so twisting your ankle. Not that I twisted my ankle in the tundra, but that's certainly a possibility. It, yeah, <laughs> very, very much a possibility. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the other thing is crossing streams is also a hazardous thing. We didn't, we don't generally speaking cross streams too much where we're working, or the one that we cross has a bridge. Um, but if you're out hiking, for example, crossing streams is uh, can be quite a hazardous thing. You have to know what you're doing, mm -hmm. pick a spot that where it's not too deep because the water is cold. It's not, it doesn't, uh, and when they're glacier-fed streams. Uh, it's better to cross in the morning than it is in the afternoon because the glaciers are melting. The and water level, the water up. level rises. Yeah, that's right. So, so the lakes are not frozen now, Wyatt, but they will be frozen um, with six feet of ice over the winter. Just a lot of ice. So they'll probably Tulik Lake will probably freeze up um, early in October, and then it will be frozen until uh, it will start to break up in in May. But the light, ice won't completely disappear until almost the end of June. Oh, Miss Thomas, are they ready for me or are you ready for me? That's the big question. <laughs> uh, I will be back on the 20th. I'll be back in the classroom on August 20th. So I, have, I haven't had any. Yeah, I, she's been so well protected. She hasn't had any mosquito bites. Yeah, bugs. no, you don't go out without your bug suit. <laughs> I've had a few. They get me on the wrist. Sometimes. Yeah, so we have a I have a list. Dr. Brett Hart and I have been writing a list of ideas for science fair projects, sixth graders, and so we'll share some of those with you. But like longer gloves, because when you're wearing the plastic gloves in the field, they don't extend up enough, and your bug suit ends like here, and so then there's this little piece of exposed uh, skin, and the bug, the mosquitoes also can get bit of that. Yeah, I mean it can starts off it's covered at the beginning of the day, but then you do something and your bug suit shirt slips a little bit and then before you know it you have a little necklace of or a bracelet of bites around yeah. your wrist. Yeah. No, I've been lucky I haven't been itchy at all. But yeah. <laughs> that's good. And luckily the one good thing about these mosquitoes is they don't carry any diseases. So that's you know, it's not like being in the tropics. Right. Right. 
Awesome. Any other any other questions for us? It's almost we're almost out of time, but we have a couple more minutes. Yeah. We, here's lightning. Yeah, I'm looking. Lighting up. Lighting up. It's light. The light mm -hmm. fog is light lift, lifting a little bit, and so maybe we can show a little bit of it, but um, it still might just look like a gray, mm -hmm. a nice gray background. <laughs> Aww, thanks, Mr. Bono. I miss you guys too. We'll see you next week. It's crazy. I'll be back to school next Monday. She'll have heat stroke when she first arrives. I know. Be nice to me, guys. <laughs> be nice to me. So. Yeah, we'll um, take a few more questions, but I think most people are wrapping up. Um, just a reminder that um, if you joined us today and you didn't get your question answered or if you have um, something else that you wish to uh, ask, you can post those to uh, Svia um, on the through her journal page. And, uh, of course, for those of you in her class, you can pester her to death the next uh, next few days when she shows up next week and ask all those questions. Um, okay, there's Amelia um, wants to know how many layers are in the mosquito outfit. And so uh, thank you, Shannon, for joining. Yeah, thanks. Good, go ahead. Uh, um, the mosquito jacket is, is kind of like a shell, like a raincoat almost, with a hood that you zip up so you're completely covered. So that's just one layer. But like today I'm wearing um, long johns and a sh two, three shirts and a vest. <laughs> yeah, so and I would you usually, layer. I usually probably have two or three layers underneath the mosquito uh, jacket. Depends on how warm it is. Um, you know, you can be really daring and wear just a t-shirt under it if it's really hot, but it's nice to have long sleeves because there's there's sort of netting for ventilation under the arms, but the mosquitoes can poke yeah, their little noses right through you. that and find you uh, if you don't have a long sleeve on. So yeah, it's best to wear a long sleeve shirt underneath it. Yep. So and then when it rains, you put your rain gear on top of the dark gear. Yeah. Um, and then you wear pants. Like I have pants I wear in the field. I have overalls uh, that are a rain material that are a thick rain material. We wear uh, extra tough boots. Uh, which are specific boots uh, for rain rubber and romping rubber boots. Um, yeah, it's funny. I really think I'm going to be a mosquito. Yeah, <laughs> likely. She's going to be so strong when she goes back. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's 89 degrees. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a shocker. Well, we're going to um, wrap this up, and I wanted to thank both of you for uh, joining today and for all the participants out there in the classes. Um, it's hard to believe that school actually started, um, but it has, and it's um, great that so many people were able to join you. So um, we will stop the recording, and the archive will be available in the next couple of days for those of you that joined us. And uh, we want to wish Doni and uh, Sophia a good rest of your season and safe travels. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.